You're listening to the USSC Briefing Room, a podcast from the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, where we give you a seat at the table for a USSC briefing on the latest developments in US news and foreign policy. We'll cover what you need to know and what's beneath the surface of the news. Hello, I'm Victoria Cooper, research editor at the United States Study Centre, and I'm delighted to take over the usual programming of the briefing room with an exciting announcement about the United States Study Centre's new Women in the Alliance initiative. But before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're recording on. The University of Sydney is located on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. What you're about to hear is an episode of the USSC live series, which records our major live events. And on the 30th of August this year, the Centre launched its Women in the Alliance initiative, and we hosted a discussion with esteemed women working in and around the Australia-US relationship to hear more about some of the challenges and opportunities facing our two countries. So this episode is about the launch of the Centre's Women in the Alliance initiative, and you might be asking, what is that? Well, listen to the episode. Ha ha ha. But in short, uh, Women in the Alliance is an initiative that wants to amplify a diverse group of voices in the working relationship between the United States and Australia. The Centre recognises that women's work in foreign policy and foreign policy analysis is not always seen or available in the same way that it is for men, and it wants to be part of the solution. So the initiative is taking steps to promote women's work by providing research and speaking opportunities, as well as establishing a network of female experts to connect and accelerate professionals in this space. But more than that, we know from our research that the Australian-US alliance needs a large, diverse and accomplished group of experts to help shape our two countries' cooperation. And the things that our countries are working on are complex, they're multi-sectoral, and they will require a lot of perspectives and experts to address. If we want to properly address our challenges, we're going to need the entire nation on board, men and women from across various industries and sectors. The work ahead is truly a whole of nation effort. And that's what we discussed on the night. We heard from Leela Smith, Melissa McIntosh, and Geraldine Duke. They're three women with vastly different experiences, expertise, and perspectives about what challenges and opportunities lie ahead for the Alliance and for women in the Alliance. As with all our live events, sometimes there are a few challenging points with the audio, but it will in no way diminish the heart of the discussion. So bear with us. And the last thing I'll say before we dive in is that at the end of the episode, I'm going to share an exciting announcement. So stay tuned all the way to the end and you'll hear a little more information about the Women in the Alliance initiative and some of the ways to get involved if you're interested. But for now, please enjoy. While it is incredibly important to focus on gender as the referent object when we talk about foreign policy and making a foreign policy uh, that respects women throughout the world. The focus of our initiative is the issues at play here, and as uh, Ms Bishop and Consul General uh, laid out, the issues at play are vast. So for a conversation about these challenges and opportunities across different sectors of our alliance cooperation, I'm delighted to invite to the stage our panellists for the evening, the Honourable Melissa McIntosh, the Federal Member for Lindsay, Geraldine Duke, a journalist and broadcaster with the ABC, and Leela Smith, the chair of the America Australia Association and CEO of the Aurora Education Foundation, a not-for-profit supporting Indigenous education. I also welcome our moderator and co-lead of the initiative, Victoria Cooper. Thanks so much, Alice. I'm going to reintroduce myself, Victoria Cooper. I'm a research editor at the United States Study Centre and will be moderating our panel tonight. And I was also one of the co-leads of the Women in the Alliance initiative, so I really uh, want to extend my personal thank you to you all for being here. Uh, it was only a few months ago that this initiative was just an idea, and so it's really exciting to see this very crucial first step uh, as it becomes a reality. Uh, and of course, the ultimate reality that we're seeking is uh, fairer representation and equality in the Alliance. So yeah, it's really exciting to have the support of everyone in this room and to also have begun this initiative tonight. Um, and before I introduce our panelists, I also want to extend uh, my acknowledgement to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation whose lands we are on tonight. And especially as we go to talk about uh, improving diversity and diverse representation in Australian foreign policy, I want to say it's my personal hope that we extend this conversation to consider how we can increase diversity across various marginalised voices uh, in our formal halls of decision making. So uh, I thought I'd give a little bit more of a bit of insight into our panel theme tonight because we've called it a whole of nation effort. 
um, which even today I was a little bit confused about what that means. It feels like a very foreign policy and defence kind of term and you might be looking at the array of voices on our panel kind of wondering how we're going to piece this conversation together. Um, but part of it is that as we look to our alliance and we look at the challenges ahead which our keynote speakers tonight have done a great job of outlining. Um, as we look to those challenges, we're seeing more and more that we need to incorporate diverse sectors and we have that representation from our panellists tonight. So as we involve more and more industries, it's great to have these industries represented here. Um, I'll just go down the row and give a bit more of an in-depth uh, introduction. So we have Geraldine Doog, uh, who is a renowned Australian journalist and broadcaster, currently the host of the ABC Radio National's Saturday Extra program, which discusses international politics and Australia's role in the international system. Uh, during her career with the ABC and commercial media, she won two Penguin Awards for excellence in broadcasting from the Television Society of Australia and a United Nations uh, Nationals Media Prize, Peace Prize. Uh, and in 2004, she was recognised with an officer in the Order of Australia for services to community and media. And then we have Leela Smith, who is a Wiradjuri woman with over 18 years experience supporting organisational change and policy reform in the not-for-profit sector, professional services, research and academia. She is the CEO of the Aurora Foundation, uh, which is a not-for-profit supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in their education and holds a Masters in Public Policy from the University of Cambridge. Leela is also the Chair of the Australia, uh, America Australian Association Board of Directors directors in Australia, which is a leading not-for-profit organisation dedicated to broadening, strengthening and developing US-Australian ties across the Pacific. And finally, we have Melissa McIntosh, who is the member for Lindsay and serves as the Liberal Party MP in the Australian House of Representatives. She is the current Deputy Chair of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Health, Aged Care and Sport and is the Shadow Assistant Minister for mental health and suicide prevention. Melissa has extensive engagement with US-Australian Bilateral Alliance, exemplified through her co-chairing of the Australia-US Parliamentary Friendship Group, as well as her involvement at the USSC as Head of Partnerships and Director of Events between 2011 and 2015, where she also directed the 21st Century Global Women's Initiative at the Centre. With all those introductions <laughs> out of the way in my long spiel, uh, I'd love to dive in and we might have a chance for audience questions at the end. So if there's anything I don't get around to, please uh, have some questions prepared. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about the Alliance. We're called the Women in the Alliance Initiative and I doubt I need to convince any of you about the need for a women's initiative considering that you're here. So let's not talk about the W, let's talk about the A uh, in, as being Alliance because there's so much to talk about. Um, and then Melissa, I might start with you. Uh, you've done a lot of work in and around the Alliance, including at the United States Study Centre. Um, and I want to ask why. Uh, you know, why are you so involved? What's your personal, why are you so personally engaged in the US-Australian relationship, both uh, in the US Study Centre, but also in your role in Parliament? Thank you. Um, I think we've swapped chairs, so the <laughs> guys are a bit, probably a bit confused. Uh, uh, it's great to have this back at the centre. Uh, when I launched uh, the initiative W21, the uh, 21st Century Global Women's Initiative in 2014, it was a bit of a bit of scary uh, experiment for the US Study Centre and it didn't last when I left. So I was so, so <laughs> happy to hear from you and your colleagues uh, to say that we want to get something up and running again and you know, congratulations to your CEO for backing you uh, on that. This is so important. As you said to me, it's not just about talking about women. That's not what this is about, but the contribution <coughs> women make right across uh, the alliance spectrum. And, for me, when I was at the centre, and uh, Julie was uh, the foreign minister at the time, doing great work, but the centre was very defence focused. And so since that time, I've had a bit of a goal to ensure that the alliance is not just about our defence relationship. Uh, of course, that is important, but it is so much more, uh, which I can go into another time. But my, the reason why I am so interested in the US, I guess, uh, was I started my early career working for American Express and I was a young 22 year old uh, on, a, you know, on the way up with my career and I had an opportunity to go to New York uh, in 2001 as part of a big public affairs conference and a week, that was less than a week, probably three days before September 11, that trip was cancelled and I was going to be staying in the Marriott Hotel and the Marriott you know, was demolished when the towers fell. 
but it really struck me there was an Australian flag that was found in the rubble of the Marriott Hotel, completely uh, torn, uh, it was burnt, but it was still almost intact. And that's, um, that's now featured uh, in Canberra uh, in the museum. And I just was quite, something about uh, that, that was a poignant moment for me that our Australian flag, uh, the Australians that perish uh, sadly um, in the towers and those that lost their lives um, after that experience, that really started something for our two countries, the power of us coming together again. That's what sort of got my interest again in, in the US and it hasn't finished. Mm. Oh, fantastic. And yeah, it's great to have that reflection about where our history has been and all the sad and the brilliant things that we can do together. So thanks very much for sharing that. Um, Geraldine, you host a show all about Australia's role. And often when we talk about the Alliance, it's really easy to just look to America and skip over what Australia is doing. But you know, in this relationship, what do you think Australia's role is, especially in international relations? And have you seen how that role has evolved over your time covering this? Well, yes, indeed, Victoria. In fact, I, I, I'm going to introduce a slightly divergent note because I think that it's tricky to be candid uh, trying to work out exactly how we develop usefully and constructively from here. Mm. Because I think, um, and I sometimes wonder whether American officials fully grasp this, we just do not have the same concept of an exceptional nation or a manifest mm. destiny. It's just completely, uh, that is not, does not exist in our self-perception, well, certainly not yet. Mm. Um, and I feel that there's often, and I'm, it's very interesting with AUKUS because my judgment is that this is very much a work in progress in terms of the, uh, a lot of attitudes in Australia. Mm. Um, I think it's, I, I certainly haven't got no definite views on this something. I think it's immensely fluid right now. But I must say, I caution a confident sense that the Australian people, while they're very, very keen on the alliance, but that they necessarily are comfortable with the sheer scale of ambition of AUKUS. Now, that's not to say they might and might become so, mm. but um, Australians are not accustomed to the sorts of ambitions and language that has been around in, uh, since AUKUS has been announced so suddenly. And I think it's going to take a while. And I think there is a genuine risk that there's a perception of, um, uh, are we really ready for this? Mm. Uh, you know, you must ne <laughs> never um, uh, underestimate Australians' capacity for uh, caution and um, questioning, self-questioning about tilting at windmills. Mm. It's a very, very deep part of our culture. I don't mind it, as a matter mm. of fact. In fact, I've been yearning for Australia to actually step across a line, to sort of emerge and think that it, it might have a full leadership role to play in the region which is ambitious and um, bold. Mm. And in fact, I, AUKUS may force us to do that. But I don't think it's bettered down yet, candidly. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think you touched on a really good point in that, you know, when we say alliance, we don't ever want to imply that the alliance is perfect. And that's something that at the centre we're quite determined to look at is, you know, as much as we talk about the alliance, we talk about solutions for the alliance and ways that we can, you know, look at the problems that exist and work on that and provide solutions. And so I guess we're not under the illusion that the alliance is perfect and that, you know, our cultures are so seamless. And I think you actually raise a really good point about culture in that Australians and Americans approach things a little bit differently. And I think Australians do have that sense of cringe when we talk about manifest <laughs> destiny or the alliance or, you know, mateship as we heard earlier tonight. Um, but part of bridging that difference in culture is people to people ties. Sure, and Leela, sure. I'd love to bring you in on, um, on that note because that's something that the AAA does. It sponsors scholarships. It makes sure that people have access to opportunities like and educational opportunities. So what's the sort of place of these people-to-people -people ties? You know, is it a side product to these orca submarines and bombs and rockets that seem to make up the icon of the Alliance? You know, what is the role of people-to-people -people connection? It's a really good question. Um, 
And, you know, you could be forgiven for thinking it's a side project. I mean, mm. the way we talk about it even tonight, we've been talking about treaties and forums and, and, and networks. Um, but that's all to protect something and to strengthen something. And that something is what matters to us. And that is people-to-people -people ties through arts, through culture, through new knowledge, through learning together. So the people-to-people -to -people ties are at, actually at the centre of it. And I think sometimes we forget that because it is so important to protect it, it's so important to strengthen it, that sometimes we forget why we're doing it. Um, so two examples that, that speak to this are, there is um, an American Australian Association scholar, an Aboriginal scholar who is just about to leave on a plane to New York to study museum studies at NYU. And he wants to learn how can museums better engage with local communities. These are our keeping places, they're our stories, they tell the story of our history, they are about our legacies. We, we need to bring communities um, into those spaces more. And people-to-people -people ties between countries strengthen that. So by taking people into another country and saying, hey, here are some of the best museums in the world, let's learn how they do it, um, that's what that can offer. And, and a STEM or a science example is uh, we've just launched a partnership with St. Vincent's Foundation uh, to do an, an exchange of, of health professionals. And one of the areas that we're looking at is movement disorders, so things like Parkinson's. We have some of the best hospitals in, in Australia and also in the US around innovation. And having health professionals work next to each other, side by side, and learning from each other, this is about looking after our families. And this is about better patient care. This is what it's all about. And AUKUS and defence and security are about protecting that. So I think it's really important that, that we don't forget that. Yeah, that we have both sides, absolutely. And I think that was a really great point of the Consul General's speech is that, you know, when we think about the Alliance, it isn't just these defence professionals, mm -hmm. it is the people that are engaged in STEM and arts and history museums and all that kind of thing that helps us have a better literacy in terms of our bilateral relationship. Um, Melissa, I'd love to bring you in again, um, especially as we kind of, I guess, put a spotlight on people and the role of people in this relationship, because ultimately, you know, what, what is the relationship if not built on the backs of the people who work for those countries? I mean, you're an elected official I, and you've worked on women's initiatives. Why, why is it that we need women in leadership and that we need women in this space? Oh, that is an a easy question. very <laughs> simple <laughs> question. That's why we're all here. Um, it's obvious and we're, we're not doing it uh, right just yet. And uh, things have progressed uh, even in politics and then things step back. So when Julie, I believe, was when she was in, you might have been the only female cabinet minister. 2013, the only mm. female cabinet. Yeah, right. Wow. It's in my mind. <laughs> And so there's still a lot of uh, work to be done in politics across the board, in, and it was mentioned um, earlier, in the business sector. Uh, and I think uh, we all do have to play a part. But also when you're talking about people, people sometimes get sick of hearing that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm so pleased that your initiative isn't just talking about women in leadership, it's actually doing the work, mm -hmm. and you happen to be women. And there's a lot of research on whether women would make better leaders, when it's wartime, would they make uh, better decisions if they were having to make those decisions when there's conflict. And sometimes the research has shown that women get into a position where they're acting like blokes. So they're actually quite aggressive. And they're not being the women that they may have once been or to going through the, the channels and through the pathways have changed when they've gotten into leadership positions. And why is that so? So there's it is an extremely complex question uh, and it's something that still needs a lot of work and we could go into the whole quota thing. Uh, and I know that uh, there's been great research by Iris Bonnet. She was very much connected to the US Study Centre in the past around the success of that. And, and I, I think that's still up for debate. Uh, but yeah, that's why we're here, because mm. it hasn't been solved. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, I mean, I'll, I'll spare you of the controversy of talking about quotas. But uh, in terms of you know, what role 
Um, it, when we're talking about the alliance, we know that there's going to be various challenges and we know that we're going to have to engage across um, various sectors. And I think that's, you know, again, something that Alice, Sophie and I were very uh, determined to have as be part of this panel was that we did want to focus on the alliance and not necessarily on women because there are women working in this space and there are women who are doing the jobs. It's just a matter of putting a spotlight on those those women, you know, I think we're very much at the point now where we have no excuses not to have women on panels because we, we exist, we're out there, we have the expertise. It's just a matter of opening that door and giving those opportunities. Yeah. Um, to kind of segue to another question, and I, we've sort of been touching on it a little bit tonight, but I'd love to get uh, a perception from each of you kind of representing the different sectors that you come from. What do you think are the kind of key challenges that are facing the Alliance right now? And we might go down the row. Um, so Gerald, answer with you. Um, well, look, I mean, obviously the elephant in the room is just the politics of America. Uh, and um, look, I made it my uh, slogan in, in, uh, in choosing stories that I, I wanted to not be addicted to the drama of Trump. Mm. So many people were addicted to the drama of Trump. And uh, I felt it was a very, I could see it. And, you know, here we, have, just the other day, we, you know, we've got a, a big presidential election in Indonesia, you know, which is just next door coming up. And, you know, there's a remarkably little interest in that. And we had sort of huge, the, the, the uh, various discussions around the uh, Chinese leadership, remarkably less than there was uh, in the, you know, that, by that stage, it was the aftermath of January the 6th and so on. Look, I think it's a, it's, and you know, we're about to go, well, who knows what we're going into? This is a very interesting point. But so I do feel like I've always hung on to the view that was introduced to me years ago America self corrects. Never forget, America self corrects. Mm. And so I think that is a terribly interesting first paragraph, if you know what I mean, mm. and worthy of real investigation. And I've tried um, to where I can to introduce that notion of how the institution is hanging on, who is self-correcting, hmm. how do we see this great um, uh, inheritance, uh, uh, this extraordinary experiment that is America, and how it did see, it, almost anticipate the problems and then self-correct. That is a wonderful story. It's amazing how few people are interested in it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm going to I feel that this is, can be a very positive story for, mm. for the US, actually, and Australia. I think a lot of Australians are sitting back pretty um, demoralised, actually, in many ways. Uh, but not completely. Not, not completely. And, and they shouldn't be. But the focus that is given, I suppose, um, and what is chosen by the media will make quite a bit of difference, I think, to Australian sense of whether this is a robust, adaptable nation that they thought it was. Mm. No, I think you're completely right. Australians do hang on to the drama and we do watch American politics like sport. I think uh, the study centre even did some media monitoring and we saw that on the same day of the, or in the same year as the Australian and the US election, Australians watched the US election more closely than they did, they did. our own election. They did. So yeah, we do, we love the drama and it's important that Australians can separate some of this drama from the institutions that actually undergird the alliance. It's not just the executive office, it's also the various institutions, the people to people ties, the you know other connections that we have. Yeah, it's a really good point and it's a huge challenge it's a as we approach. It's a story. Next but yeah. slightly more, you know, it's certainly not as dramatic as some of the, the various people. But if, if, you, if you care to go into the, the different component parts, it's a fascinating story. Mm. And to watch how that might work. And I think that's, you know, to me, that's the media's job is to show the complexity of that mm. and how, it, um, how it's putting up a heck of a fight. Yeah, fantastic. All right, Leela, how about you? What are the challenges facing the US-Australian relationship? Uh, so I'm about six months into the role of the chair of the American Australian Association and the list of stakeholders is like nothing I have seen before. <laughs> and we just heard from, from General Consul Christine Elder talking about the and now the opportunities are greater than ever before as well. That is a strength but it is also a challenge. When we are thinking about the alliance, the sheer breadth and depth of stakeholders is overwhelming. 
And that's a challenge. It's a challenge to pick up on what you were saying, Geraldine, about reacting to um, drama or reacting to things in the moment and the challenge of that eclipsing longer term um, things that might not be front page news but are just as important and leaving space for that in our relationships and making sure that we steward those relationships um, and not get, not get soaked up and, and eclipsed by, um, by things that we're reacting to in the moment. So I think that is the biggest challenge for us. Um, and, and it's certainly something that we all need to deal with if we're in this space in the Alliance, is mm -hmm. keeping an idea what is our priority and not being swept up in things in the moment, but um, leaving space for things that are yet to come down the track as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Who knows where we're going to be in another 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, and we need to make sure that we're, we're continuing to stoke those, those fires too. Hmm. I think my heart rate just elevated when you said we don't know where we're going to be in the next yeah. five, ten years. It's a, two it's years. Really yeah, yeah, two years. Yeah. It's a very frightening thought. And I mean, it makes me very glad that I'm not the one having to make the decisions, which brings me to Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> as, as one of the key decision makers. I mean, where do you start? There's so many priorities, as we've been hearing. As a, as a decision maker, how do you create policy priorities? Where do you begin with the US-Australian relationship? Yeah, and... For me, in answering your previous question as well, it is very much all about China, but not always in the way that we may think. For example, I ha I'm very passionate about Australian manufacturing and we saw uh, the challenges in our supply chains during the pandemic, uh, but we've also seen a quite an, a, a disturbing increase of intellectual property theft uh, by Chinese companies when it comes to Australian manufacturing. Uh, an example of this, an Australian company uh, in Western Sydney uh, produced safety components for, uh, for railway lines. And their product uh, went online. It got completely ripped off uh, by a Chinese company and then sold as the Aussie product to the Victorian government. And the only way this was found out was the product failed. And this is a failed product on a railway line. And then, you know, then the Australian uh, manufacturer had to step in. They got called uh, to Victoria and said, your product's failed. We're like, we don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, and then it's so, so on. So but this is an, an isolated story. And I've spoken uh, to colleagues in the US about this, and they're experiencing those same challenges. Uh, talking about China, then obviously we, we go into the pandemic, and uh, again we saw um, when you know we saw weaknesses in our manufacturing. Everyone wanted a mask. Uh, everyone started making masks. Who wants masks now? Who makes masks? So there's things that we want to forget about in the pandemic, and we saw this. I, I'm on the, as you mentioned, the health committee, and we ran the first uh, inquiry in the country into long COVID. And it's extraordinary how many people are suffering with long COVID in this country and no one really knows how to deal with it. So we have challenges uh, that may not be just in the defence and security space, but are very real and very much impacting our small businesses, our manufacturers and our people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, one of the big challenges uh, in the future, particularly thinking about what are we going to do when the next pandemic hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm far too quick to hope that the next pandemic is far, far away. It still is unbelievable to think it's only two years ago. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm reticent to finish our conversation on, a, on, on the challenges, um, but we might get an opportunity for audience questions, maybe just one or two. Um, but before we do that, I'd love to hear on a more optimistic note, you know, maybe uh, you, what are you looking forward to in the future of the US-Australian relationship? If there's opportunities that we can seize you know, what is it that excites you about the future of the bilateral alliance? And we'll go down the line again. Oh, well, we can't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't Melissa start? Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was too doom and gloom. I've got to like, yeah, balance myself out again. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, you, yeah, you want yeah, to? Okay. You just I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think very much young people. And this is why the US Studies Centre was 
started in the first place because young people in Australia had no idea about the US. And I feel like uh, you mentioned uh, that people are a bit wary of the relationship. People just take it for granted. Mm. And I feel like we may be taking it for granted again. So uh, I think it's more important now than ever to have the US Studies Centre so our young people uh, have this understanding because there are challenges. Have an understanding of why AUKUS is so important and why it takes so long uh, to get a submarine. Have an understanding of, of what's going on, not just in the defence space, but in other areas as well, in health, in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, in critical minerals. This is, this is what I think, uh, the, the, why the future is bright and it's not so doom and gloom, it's because of our young people. Fantastic, I'm feeling good. Yeah. Let's continue it on, <laughs> Leila. <laughs> Uh, two examples, two stories um, of things that I'm really excited about that I have seen in the last couple of months um, and that I think we're going to see a lot more of. Um, the first is I had the privilege of calling one of the scholarship recipients um, to tell them that they'd been successful. She was this um, young Aboriginal girl, grew up in Redfern and um, so as soon as she realised she wanted to do a Masters of Music Management um, in New York, she started saving. So she's been saving since she's seven. She got in and I got to call her and say, you know, she's got, a few, she's got quite a few scholarships. It's very expensive to do a bachelor degree in the US. And so this was a little top up scholarship. Um, and when I called her and said, you know, this was a, an all Aboriginal panel from an Aboriginal organisation and said, you know, you've been successful. She burst into tears and she said, it means so much um, you know, I've got a lot of scholarships, but to know that, you know, there is a group of your own people who are backing you as well, it hits differently. And to tie that to this initiative, knowing there are a group of women and people who are supporting women to support women, that hits a little bit differently. To, um, to and, and other mainstream organisations also need to be doing their part. But it does feel different. And I think this is really exciting to see a group of women coming together and talking about that. Um, the second example is as we get more diverse people through, they have different experiences and perspectives to offer. We were interviewing one student who was applying to do um, human rights law um, uh, in the US. And we said to her, um, you know, she was from the Torres Straits, why, why are you doing this? Why is this so important? And this was right at the end of the interview, and she'd been kind of talking around the point for a bit. And we said, sorry, why are you interested in looking at human rights law with a specialty in climate change? And she said, because my ancestors' bones are washing up on the beach, because the water levels are rising, and it is washing away their kind of burial areas. Imagine having that degree of lived experience and then what you can do with an overseas experience. We're getting, to build on your point, young people coming through, young people with more experiences and more people backing them from places that they know. So that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, fantastic. More diverse perspectives in the future. Now, Geraldine. Yeah, well, I can't, I can't. It's hard with the It's hard with the media. I can't top that. Look, I, I would like. Um, what I hope for is that the US helps us grow mm. in our sense of ourselves, mm. which harks back to what I said at the very start. Um, you know, we, we've, and look at the story we've got to tell of our history. I, I remember interviewing somebody a little while ago, some Frenchman who said something like, oh, you know, we have found these caves and they are 5,000 years old. I said, my gosh, we can do a lot better than that. Yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't resist it, you know. Um, and it, just that sort of growing sense that we're, we sit at this, on this amazing story here that, that we're just gradually getting to. It's extraordinary. And um, look, I think Australia is in, it's a, there was a wonderful phrase used by the very first uh, Benedictine Catholic bishop here in Australia, way back in 1880, Bishop Polding, who said, Australia is a process of becoming. And I think it's a stunning um, phrase because we're a long way from being, I think, as where we could be, where, as poised as we could be, as believing in ourselves as we could be, as ready to sort of step up uh, to take a role that I think we probably could play um, in our region 
without sounding as if we think that we're the only one to do it. You know, mm -hmm. like there's that great, there's, there's the caution straight away. Oh, what's she saying? What's she <laughs> tilting at? For goodness sake, get a grip. So, you know, I think in a way, um, the US is very used to this. And sometimes I think gets very frustrated with us that we don't find that a, a very, um, that we're not dying to be there. We're not yet. Mm. So if uh, a bit of patience possibly required and a bit of real recognition that there's a growth underway and that we have a lot to contribute to. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Now, unfortunately, I have misled you all. And we are out of time for audience questions. Oh. <laughs> so I very much apologise. But on a, on a personal note, as an Australian and as a woman and as a young person, I feel very energised about the conversation that we've had tonight and the contributions of everyone here, just how much support there is behind this initiative and that we're not necessarily forging new territory, but there's already these trailblazers that have come in and forged this path for us. So I'm very, very encouraged by the conversation we've had tonight. And thank you very much for your Pleasure. participation. Thank you. I will pass over to Sophie Mayer, who will close us out. But um, we can stay here. Thanks, Victoria. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophie Mayo. I'm a research associate with the Foreign Policy and Defence Program and a co-lead of the Women in the Alliance Initiative. I want to take a moment to thank our panellists, Geraldine Doog, Melissa McIntosh, and Leela Smith, for a fantastic conversation, and extend that thanks to Chancellor Bishop and Consul General Elder, for their insightful remarks. I also want to thank the State Department for their generous support, as well as USSC's board and leadership uh, and the events team led by Janine Pinto. Thanks are also due to Ambassador Jane Hardy and the Winds Alliance from the National Security College, who were really instrumental in their preliminary discussions that helped to shape this initiative. But that's not all. As you would have seen on the beautiful flyer that our design team created, uh, Women in the Alliance has a really, really exciting activity agenda for the year ahead. Uh, and tonight we're pleased to announce that the US Study Center is seeking expressions of interest to participate in the inaugural Women in the Alliance Network. The network will bring together a highly accomplished group of early career female professionals working across industries related to the Australia-US relationship. These individuals will receive exclusive opportunities designed to advance and accelerate their careers, amplify their expertise and expand their professional networks. The network will meet quarterly for closed door roundtables in Sydney with distinguished US and Australian experts professional development and issues-based workshops. Discussion themes and industries will span the remit of the bilateral relationship, uh, including defense cooperation and Indo-Pacific strategy, investment and trade, technology, innovation and intelligence, climate change, the energy transition and our role in the region. The inaugural workshop is scheduled for the 2nd of November and will feature roundtables with Michelle Flournoy, former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, Olivia Nuzzi, Washington correspondent for the New York Times, and our own Peter Dean, Director of the Foreign Policy and Defense Program, and a principal author of Australia's 2023 Defense Strategic Review. So please spread the word far and wide among your networks. <laughs> Expressions of interest are now open on our new USSE website, I should add, and will be accepted on a rolling basis uh, closing on the 22nd of September. Women in the Alliance has three other key pillars which we look forward to engaging with you all on over the course of the coming year. This includes inviting visiting US experts to Australia to share insights with young professionals, researchers and Australian officials, public events with Australian and US experts, and paid commissioned research for female researchers. So look out for these further announcements and I hope you will enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. So how is that? So good. One thing I really loved about that night was when Leela shared about the tangible impact that people-to-people -people exchange has on real lives, as well as the mechanics of the bilateral relationship. It's not all bombs and rockets, things like education and sharing culture and history and experiences. They're also things that are vital to our alliance relationship. And it's really important reminder of the need for diverse perspectives in our decision-making 
and in any kind of effort that seeks to enhance cooperation before our two countries. So I found that a really interesting and different panel discussion and I'm really glad we got the opportunity to share it with you all. Now, as I promised, here's the exciting announcement. The United States Study Centre is now inviting expressions of interest for its inaugural network. The network will bring together a highly accomplished group of female professionals to receive exclusive opportunities that will advance and accelerate their careers, amplify their expertise and expand their professional network. The network will meet quarterly for closed door roundtables in Sydney with distinguished US and Australian experts, professional development and issue-based workshops. We'll be offering arrangement for interstate travel, so we also welcome applications from across Australia. The themes of these workshops and closed door roundtables will expand the remit of the entire bilateral relationship. So we're talking about defence cooperation and Indo-Pacific strategy, things like trade and investment, technology, innovation and intelligence, climate change, the energy transition, all of these things, all of the ways that our countries cooperate. So we're looking for expressions of interest from a range of industries and sectors. So we're welcoming economists, we're welcoming teachers, academics, historians, please submit your applications. Throughout their term, these network members will also be offered functional professional development training in things like leadership development, presenting with confidence, uh, how to do policy design, and how to effectively engage the stakeholders. And in addition, members of this network will also receive invitations to extend exclusive United States Study Center events, and as well, like pitch their research to our network and uh, further expose them and their expertise to high caliber professionals that we meet with. Through their participation, members of the Women in the Alliance Network will also be equipped to contribute to the national and bilateral relationship dialogue about the challenges and opportunities shaping the US-Australian relationship and our region. The inaugural workshop is scheduled for the 1st of November this year, and it will feature a roundtable discussion with Michelle Flournoy, who's the former Undersecretary of Defence for Policy. Uh, it also will feature Olivia Nuzzi, who's the Washington correspondent for New York Magazine. And uh, our own Professor Peter Dean, the Director of the United States Study Center Foreign Policy and Defense Program, who was also the co-lead on the 2023 Defense Strategic Review. So it's looking like the first workshop is going to be amazing. So get those expressions of interest in as soon as possible. They'll be accepted on a rolling basis until the end of September. So got to move quickly. And you can find all the details for that on our website. Now, as we wrap up, if you've enjoyed this live recording, don't forget you can listen to our USC live series for all our live events like this one. We will also have our Asia Chessboard podcast, which is hosted by our own CEO, Dr. Green, and the Freeman Chair for China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Jude Blanchett. You can find all of these episodes on our brand new website, usc.edu.au, or wherever you get your podcasts.